Uh, all right, with that, we're going to move on to our last agenda item of today. Uh, we are welcoming Lou Glazer from Michigan Future to provide a presentation building on a lot of the conversations that we have been having over the last few weeks as it relates to uh, the Michigan Population Council report uh, and the broader conversations about where Michigan is right now as it relates to prosperity for our residents, not only population, but successes. Uh, and where do we go from here? So Lou, welcome to committee and take it away. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair, for the, in, uh, for the invitation and also uh, thank you for your leadership in um, sort of putting on the table a reassessment of the state's economic development strategy. Um, before I get started, I wanna just walk through for you what's in the handout packet, so, which, which is a lot of detail that we're not gonna cover because it will take forever. Um, <clears throat> so there's, there's four items there. The first one is and you see on the uh, screen here, is a re-release of a report that we did in 2004 uh, on uh, laying out sort of our thoughts about um, a path to prosperity for the state. Um, so, and, and that's mainly what we're gonna talk about today. Uh, the second is an op-ed that Don Grimes, who's the co-author of this, and I wrote for the Detroit News that summarizes the report. The third is a set of pretty detailed and wonky slides that are the data that goes with the report that we did when we did the uh, press announcement. Uh, and the fourth handout is the uh, testimony that I did to the Grow Michigan Together Council, which includes our policy recommendations. So if you have any questions on any of that stuff now or later, I'm more than happy to take questions or to come talk to you one-on-one -on -one or whatever about all that stuff. So what, what we want to do today is just really a high-level overview of, um, of, our think, of sort of where Michigan is at in terms of, uh, its, in terms of the economic well-being of Michigan households. Uh, and then talk a little bit about what we see as the most important levers that are available to the state for Michigan to be a high prosperity state again. So Michigan Future starts in 1991 um, as a think tank focused on the economic well-being of Michigan households. From our inception, we understood that a low unemployment rate with lots of people unable to pay the bills is not a good economy. A high growth rate with lots of people not able to pay the bills is not a good economy. That what matters is, is whether we have an economy that, uh, that works for everybody. We use the, we've been using the phrase rising income for all. An economy as it grows that benefits everybody. For most of the 20th century, Michigan was a place where everybody who worked hard could pay the bills, raise their family, save for retirement, save for their kids' education, save pay for emergencies. What, um, what's happened since is that um, we are now a low prosperity state, and we'll go through that. So, uh, and I mentioned when I did this testimony yesterday, <clears throat> from 1920 to 1970, when Michigan was amongst the highest wage states in the country, people flocked here from all over the planet. We went, in the 1920s, we had 13 congressional seats. In the 70s, we had 19 congressional seats. Since then, as we be a, became a low wage state, we've gone from 19 seats back to 13. We're at the lowest we've been since the 1920s. So what Michigan needs and what made us successful, the Michigan that we all remember is one of the richest places on the planet, is we need to be a high-wage state again. So from 1991 when we started until this report in 2004, our assumption was that the, that the key to doing that uh, was advanced manufacturing. 
which has sort of been sort of the thing that everybody's been thinking about for quite a while. <clears throat> By 2004, the data was pretty clear to us that, and, and that's really what this, that's why there's a question mark in the title of this report. It was clear to us that what the data was saying is, is that the high prosperity states in America were now concentrated in knowledge-based industries. Um, and the knowledge-based industries are uh, information, which is telecommunications, uh, software, and, uh, and old and new media, uh, finance and insurance, professional and business services, which is law firms, accounting firms, marketing firms, all those kinds of firms, and, uh, and corporate headquarters. Today, those four industries are one in eight jobs in America, 24 million jobs, with an average wage of 130,000. They are the high growth, high wage sector of the American economy. And if you are not knowledge-based economy concentrated, you cannot be a high prosperity state. Our, we're gonna do the, the top 10 slide, uh, the top 10 state slide. Uh, which is in your handouts kind of thing. Yeah, there, let's see. So I can, you guys can, I can't read that, but you guys can read it. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> yeah, and you also have it in your handouts if uh, you're unable to read it. So this is a list, and, and it's a year out of date, this is a list of the top 10 per capita income states in the country that are not fossil fuel extraction states. So the top 10 includes Wyoming and Alaska. They're not on this slide. But as you can see, in every, every, other, every other state is, is, a, is highly ranked in the wages and employer, employee benefits, employer paid benefits that they get from the knowledge economy. And secondly, because this is the asset that matters most to knowledge-based employers. They have a high percentage of adults, and particularly young adults, with a four-year degree. There is no other way to be a high-prosperity state in America now other than small population state with, with uh, fossil fuel extraction to being a high-prosperity state. That was what was new about the 2004 report. And we ended the 2004 report by saying, if Michigan does not concentrate uh, young talent, and if we did not um, uh, grow the, our knowledge economy, we were gonna be a low prosperity state. So what happened? Michigan is 30th in knowledge economy concentration and 31st in the proportion of young adults with a four-year degree. From 1999 to 2022, Michigan went from 16th in per capita income to 39th. So this, this slide is 38th. As I said, it's a year out of date. So we're, we're, 30, we're 39th. We're 13% below the national average in per capita income it's the lowest we've ever been since the Fed started keeping statistics in 1929. The reason we re-released the report is not to take credit for we got it right. It is because if we were writing the report from scratch today, we would write exactly the same report. The same conclusions we reached in, 20, in 2004 are as accurate today in 2024. Here's the most scary thing of all. If we have, if every state performs in the next two decades the way they did in the last two decades, in 2044, Michigan will be 48th in per capita income ahead of only Alabama and Mississippi. We do not want to be 48th. We should not want to be 39th. So, our belief is, is that there are three levers that are available to state government 
to reverse this 20-year decline. And the 20-year decline has been irrespective of who's been in control politically in either Lansing or Washington. Um, I mean, this, this has just been a, a really bad two decades for Michigan for economic, oh, for economic well-being. The one other thing I should add is probably the most important. So 39th sounds sort of, you know, maybe wonkish. Here's the reality. Six in 10 jobs in Michigan do not pay enough to support a middle-class household of three. Our average wages are now, in 1979, 19% 19 above the national average when we were growing our population. In 1999, 5% above. Today, 10% below. The reason we're 39th is, is that too many of our jobs are low wage. We need a high wage job strategy if Michigan's gonna be prosperous again. So the three levers. The first, and in many ways is the most important because it really changes everything. And it was recommended by the Growing Michigan Together Council is, we need to define economic success in income terms, not employment terms. They recommended top 10 state in median household income. You could do top 10 state in average wages. There's a whole set, but it's got to be whether working people in Michigan earn enough money to support a, to raise a family and, and save. That's, that's lever number one. Lever number two. The most important thing to whether we're prosperous or not going forward is where Generation Z, particularly college-educated Generation Z, chooses to live. We lost the millennials, particularly college-educated millennials, and we got poorer. If we do the same with Generation Z, we are in big trouble. And so that's, that's lever number two, is create places where Generation Z, particularly college-educated Generation Z, wants to live, and that means uh, transit-rich, vibrant central cities, period. And third, we need an education system, K-16, which is designed to substantially increase the proportion of Michigan kids, particularly non-affluent kids, who earn bachelor's degrees. Not because people who don't get bachelor's degrees are unimportant or can't find, but it is the asset that matters most to high wage employers. And it also, uh, young people with bachelor's degrees are the creators of new high wage industries. So what we said in 2004, we will say again today, if we do not uh, concentrate young talent in Michigan, and if we do not increase the proportion of our kids who earn bachelor's degrees, if everything else we do that we call economic development, we do terrifically well, we will get poorer. These two things trump everything else. So if you want a high prosperity Michigan, if you want a Michigan that's 16th again rather than 39th or 48th, those are the two things that matter most. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I know we will very likely have some member questions. I, I do want to start off um, by kind of asking specifically, also just taking credit for being a college-educated uh, millennial who did move to Michigan, so I'm trying to reverse the trends. Um, what other regions or cities or states have you seen that are successfully attracting Gen Z? Oh, well, Gen Z is a little, I mean, <coughs> or Gen Z is less, just less turning 25 yeah. right now kind of thing. So the millennials. So the big success story nationally is uh, Denver, is Colorado. Uh, Denver in the early, well, when this report was released in 2004, made their economic development strategy 100% placemaking. 100% placemaking. Everybody says that we can't be Denver because they have the mountains. In 2004, they had 45,000 young professionals. Today, 
after starting with regional transit and then a huge effort to redevelop the city in terms of high density, high amenity, walkable communities. They have 110,000. They no longer have to offer any incentive packages. Companies want to come there for talent, the most, the asset that matters most to them. Colorado, before this, was a energy dominant state. They now are a broad knowledge economy state. I think they're fifth in, where's the chart? I think they're fifth in per capita income now. So they're, they're sort of the success, the big success story. People ask me about um, places that have made the transition. I couldn't answer the question yesterday. I think I can answer it today. I've been thinking about this. Uh, Washington State was Boeing. They made airplanes. Now, they're Microsoft and Amazon. They're in, and, and they have one of the great talent magnets in the world in Seattle. So they're another example. In the Midwest, Minnesota, nationally, so as you saw in this chart, Massachusetts is like the gold standard for everybody. They're both the most educated state in the country and the highest prosperity state in the country. In the 1980s, Massachusetts per capita income in Michigan's were the same. Today, they're th Massachusetts $30,000 more than us. The reason, they're number one in the knowledge economy. So those are the examples that I can think of. Thank you very much. We have a question from Senator Paul Hanke. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I, gosh, I don't even know where to start. Um, I've always enjoyed your work. Thank you. Um, it's just, it, it seems counterintuitive. Like, like when I was a 22-year-old, two weeks after I graduated, I was in Los Angeles. As I just looked up the LA Times and went and mm -hmm. I became a nanny because I wanted out. Um, and, I, and at that time, I wasn't chasing the weather. Right. So, it, you know, in terms of things that we can control, the this placemaking, um, um, I think it, it, we sort of can. Um, vibrant central cities, dense, walkable, high amenities, activity rich, great parks, safe streets, extensive mass transit, and what it is not, the, the, the things that are not attracting like Gen Z, which you'd think they might, is like low taxes, they don't care. Low housing, they don't care. Right. Um, child care, they're not thinking about that yet. High standardized test scores, they're not thinking about that. The weather, they're not even that concerned with that. Um, is it a red state or blue state? They're not concerned with that. Right. So um, I think it's important that your report, and this is the only right. place that I've seen it, is right. in your work, spells right. that out. Right. What are the young people wanting and what don't they care about that we think they care about, but they don't? Correct. What happened, so I'm, I'm assuming somewhere along, I remember the cool cities, was that a grand home thing? It was. Like, we, they <laughs> tried, I mean, you know, so what happened with that? Um, right. That's the, like a first part of my question. The second thing is coming from an education, you know, background, I chair the education committee. You know, it's, you know, sometimes I don't even want to say out loud, we need more kids with bachelor's degrees because people will be like, well, what about the skilled trade certificates? What about the CTE? What about, you know, associate's degrees and all that? But the fastest way, and it's been like this, and I feel like it's gonna be like this forever, the fastest way to what kids want these days with just, just a middle class income. Correct. Is a bachelor's degree. Correct. That is a fact. So, you know, I'm not afraid to say that. And, and we, we shouldn't be afraid to, to say that. Um, so I guess I, you know, and then the last thing I'm going to say is, um, I think, what would you think if, cause you mentioned the, one of the uh, magnet industries is old and new media. So like if we had some sort of film incentive or TV <laughs> oh. new media incentive, do you think the young people would stay with that? So cool cities, what happened? 
And then um, what do you think about bringing more creative industry here? Oh, God. Um, cool cities. So, um, you know, I think the, the impetus, which was pretty similar to what we were writing about, was right. But, I mean, it ended up being a small grant program that went to every city in the state kind of thing, as, as opposed to what Denver did, which is start with transit, which is not cheap, and then, and then concentrated neighborhoods in, in central cities. I mean, the, look, I understand the political difficulty with this. I mean, this is really hard politically. The reality is, is if Detroit, Grand Rapids, Ann Arbor, and Lansing don't work, the state is not gonna concentrate young talent. I mean, and that initiative was not concentrated at all. So with small grants, every place, for little projects, what is needed is the, the single most important thing, but the politics here have been just impossible. The single most important thing is transit, particularly rail transit. That's what everybody's led with around the country. In addition to that, it is high density, walkable, uh, high amenity urban neighborhoods. Those are the two things that matter. That whole list that you led, read that everybody thinks matters, great, great cities trump it all. Period. You know, and it doesn't matter if it's Austin in a red state or Boston in a blue state. It's great cities. Oh, um, the education question. So tell me. Oh. Yep. So Georgia's poorer than us. <laughs> I mean, they're 41st, I think, in per capita income. Um, so, look, my board is all over the place on incentives, so we do not take a position on incentives. But um, what, what I think we all agree on is, is that if you don't concentrate talent and you don't increase bachelor's attainment, all the incentives in the world are not going to work. The stuff that matters most are those two things. All right, next up, we have a question from Senator Geis. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, thank you, Lou. Um, thank you. Also been following your work for many years, and actually we met many years ago Yeah. Um, in a different capacity. Um, Gen Xer, transplant from Massachusetts, mother to a Gen Zer, college-bound Gen Zer. Yeah. Um, have we, I really appreciate you talking about income um, versus number of jobs. Because right. I think, especially in the areas that many of us represent, um, you have a lot of folks who might have, I, I always kind of chuckle at the, the jobs report because they're talking about a number, but we know, how many people do we know who have two and three part-time jobs? Correct. But still, there isn't enough month at the end of the money. Correct to be able to sustain themselves. So I think part of the issue is not just those higher wages, but also some of these, some of these industries and companies paying their employees what they're worth so that no one has to have <laughs> two part-time jobs. Right. They can sustain themselves on one full-time job regardless of what level of degree, post-secondary degree they have. Um, but my other question is, you know, as a, you know, disaffected Gen Xer. Um, the, you know, we grew up in, a, in an era where we were told by a lot of folks like what, what we're supposed to like and do and want and all of that. Um, have we asked Gen Z what they actually want and need? Or are we deciding as Gen X and millennials and yep. boomers what it is that we think is going to attract them? Senator, should we uh, invite your guest up to provide no, testimony? Say. <laughs> yeah, so I get this question a lot about uh, from uh, communities that are not big cities about what is it that we should do. And my first thing I say to them is talk to your high school students and college students and ask them what they want to stay in your community and do it. And do it. 
Um, so by and large, nobody does that, right? I mean, we we still have a vision of a built environment that is that is based on what you know the boomers wanted more than anybody else kind of thing. This makes no sense at all. So I agree a thousand percent is um, that the single best thing that we can do when we think about built environment, which is what we think really matters enormously, including transportation, is um, is talk to Generation Z and let and build the community. Because ultimately, look, I mean, this is true statewide. If kids who grow up in your community don't want to live in your community, it is not going to be successful. Thank you. Um, and I appreciate that because I think we often forget that these, these, these kids um, are young adults, yep. right? They do have, um, they might not have as, as much economic power as those of us who've been in the workforce for a really long time, but they also, they are, they're voting. My eldest voted for the first time the other day. Yep. Um, so like they, they do, we should be listening to them and what they say they need. Right, so they may not have as much uh, economic well-being as sort of older folks kind of stuff, but they are the most mobile. Young people, young adults move far more than anybody else. So they've got all the choices in the world. They do not have to stay where they grew up. And if we don't take them seriously, um, we're in big trouble. Something that we uh, will have a follow-up conversation on uh, is Hillary Doe from the Population Council will come back. We had a first presentation about kind of scratching the surface on some of the surveys, but we will invite her back to present some of the findings, particularly from the many surveys and meetings they did with young people to ask them directly, what do you want to stay here? So more to come on that. Uh, next up, we have a question from Vice Chair Victory. Thank you, Madam Chair. I appreciate the presentation, Lou. Thank you. Um, just one thing that kind of um, some anecdotal issues in my district, um, but you highlight high density, and I was wondering, like post COVID, have you seen a change in the numbers post COVID? Because I was an anecdotal story in my district, uh, more Illinois license plates you can ever think of, and it's and we oh, it's increasing right? the population, yeah. and we're uh, even in my office I have a Gen Z worker that came from Illinois, yeah. Southern Chicago, yeah. and uh, it's just uh, but that's a good thing. But we're no our area's identity a lot along the coast is with yeah. Chicago, so yeah. it's um, and in the meantime we have it's you know, limited housing and those components, but it just seems to be post COVID there's a continue influx. And some from our higher education areas that they you know they come to attend some of the colleges there and seem to be retention there. So I just wonder anything from post COVID high density because yeah. I know some of the transit systems you know they didn't have the ridership et cetera and yeah, where no, are we transit's at now? having trouble post COVID. Mm -hmm. um, so um, it's the data is in the um, in my testimony. Which you to the population commission we got so post COVID uh, no, this is just twenty five to thirty four olds with four year degrees so it that's that's the group that we're looking at they are just as over concentrated in big metros and big cities as they were before COVID so um, I mean I'll just give you the number I mean this is the, these numbers are somewhat astonishing um, New York City has seven hundred thousand. Um, young professionals post COVID, uh, about the same number as they had pre COVID. Uh, Chicago is 300,000. Um, Detroit is 18,000. Grand Rapids is 20,000. Ann Arbor is 18,000. I mean, so, um, so Denver is well over 100,000. Austin, you know, Austin's sort of the big success story now with. Young professionals, they're now well over 100,000. So at least with 25 to 34 year olds, um, they are still choosing high density, high amenity central cities where they don't have to own a car. All right, our next question is from Senator McDonald Rivet. Hi, uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Lou, for coming. Also, a fan of your work, particularly since I worked for you for several years. Um, <laughs> 
Uh, I actually just wanted uh, to, I wanted to get back to Senator Polhinky's education question, and yep. I think it's too important to have been, we need, I, I'd like for you to respond to that one. Thanks. Uh, this is about the importance of bachelor's degrees. Bachelor's degree, skilled trade, CTE, yeah. let's yeah. talk about how we're preparing our kids. Yep. So here, I mean, this is so, um, <clears throat> factually, there are two things that are true. Um, the, um, the, your, the wage premium between a bachelor's degree and everything less than a bachelor's degree is substantial and growing. So the most reliable way of having a middle class uh, career, particularly 40 year career, uh, is by getting a bachelor's degree. It does not mean that everybody needs a bachelor's degree. It doesn't mean that the only good paying jobs are with a four year degree, but overwhelmingly um, folks with four year degrees, you know, have better for you have better economic outcomes than those without the problem we have at the moment is this is really this is sort of not a good thing is so the fed found that for 21 to 29 year olds in america that if one of your parents has a four-year degree 71 percent of their kids have four-year degrees if both parents have a high school degree it's 19 percent that has to change there is no racial equity agenda progress and there is no economic mobility progress unless more non-affluent kids get four-year degrees period and we have got to stop telling other people's kids that they don't need four-year degrees so that's number one number two every kid needs to learn about both the carpenter and architect and it's their choice which of the two to pursue there is nothing wrong with being a carpenter we need to have every kid have an opportunity to think about becoming a carpenter. But third, we need to stop telling kids that carpenters make as much as architects. They don't. All right, I'm gonna take a point of privilege and ask a question mostly before I forget. Uh, <laughs> your kind of line of statements leads me to think about strategy and kind of how we bridge the gap and, and where we go. Um, as we've been talking to legislators, policymakers from across the country over the last year or so, something that stood out to me when I, I talked to legislators in Virginia is they had a radical reform of their economic development strategy. And, you know, incentives aside, let's not even talk about that. Right. But they changed their strategy to focus solely on attracting headquarters, headquarters. or yeah. expanding headquarters. Yeah. And I would imagine, you know, if that's your focus, that, mm -hmm. again, incentives aside, that's who you're going after, that's who you're trying to attract. Uh, and in reading the new geography of jobs back in 2016, you know, it feels like in Michigan, oftentimes we talk about the industry and the multiplier effect right. instead of the position and the multiplier effect. So Correct. thinking about the executive, the designer, the engineer who's going to need lawyers, accountants, all the other support groups, it seems that there is a higher multiplier for those higher salary jobs. Exactly. So as you look at a strategy like that, is that something that Michigan should consider adopting where even if it's in our same core industries and competencies, we are focusing our attention on a different aspect of attraction and retention? Um, so... There's a guy named Edward Glazer who's no relation at all, who's an urban economist at Harvard. Who um, His economic development theory is great schools, great cities get out of the way. And I think he's right. Um, so if you did something like that in Washington State, you would try to build off of Boeing, right? And there would be no Microsoft, no Amazon. You cannot get... Uh, this would be an interesting conversation to have. I heard Bill Gates do a presentation on this um, where he claimed that no one in Washington knew what software was, let alone was interested in subsidizing it. I bet you Dan Gilbert says the same thing about reinventing mortgage mortgages. Nobody picked that as an industry. 
I, I just am really skeptical about our ability to pick industries. Where you have young talent, they are entrepreneurial. They will create high wage. Um, they will create high wage uh, enterprises, and we have no clue in what industry. So I, the headquarter thing, though, is very interesting uh, because that basically is high wage knowledge economy is where we need to put our attention, and that's and that's. But Virginia's so Virginia replaced that list that had the top ten has Illinois on it. Uh, in the new date of Virginia replaced uh, Illinois. V Virginia is a high bachelor's degree state. That's what matters most. Thank you. Senator Lindsay, thank you for your patience. So I didn't forget my question. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you for the great presentation today. I think I have two quick questions. Sure. One, you may have covered this, but if not, could you explain why you exclude or say more about why you exclude energy extraction states from your list? Oh, just because they don't follow this pattern at all. I mean, there, there are two paths to high prosperity in America today. One is knowledge, the second is fossil fuels. So there, there are four fossil fuel states in the top 15, the two Dakotas and Alaska and Wyoming. It's, it's sort of like not an option for most states. So. Thank you for that. And the, the other question I had is, um, there's such an emphasis put on the per capita income, and I was wondering if you could say more about the relationship between that and something like cost of living. Mm -hmm. Obviously, this list jumps out as something where a lot of people struggle to balance that, where they yep. uh, look at these states and they say, yeah, if I do get a great degree and get a really high earning job, that would be capita income. And I was wondering if you could say more about the relationship between that and something like cost of living. Mm -hmm. Obviously, this list jumps out as something where a lot of people struggle to balance that, where they yep. uh, look at these states and they say, yeah, if I do get a great degree and get a really high earning job, that would be great, but I also have to understand that the cost is gonna be very high to live in one of those places. Oh, boy. <laughs> Believe me, this is something we, Grimes and I debate this like for 30 years now. <laughs> So he wants to correct for cost of living, and I don't. Um, okay, so let me, uh, I mean, I shouldn't do this, but I'll ask the question, because I just, the main difference in cost of living is the cost of housing. How many of you would rather have your house value lower? For tax purposes only. Yeah. <laughs> but for wealth building purposes, probably not. Right. Yeah. So it's like, Look, th this is my sense about all economics that I've learned. I mean, um, people pay a higher price for something because they think they're getting something for their money. So young professionals are way over-concentrated in high-cost places, and all their parents think they're dopes. They are not dopes, because what they're paying for is the neighborhood. It's worth it to them. So that's why I don't like correcting for cost of living. I mean, because I think, you know, it's, it's you know, uh, middle class parents raising children will pay higher housing costs to get a good school district. They're not dopes. So, and if you take housing out, this li the cost of living stuff, does that's really the main driver of the difference in cost of living is, is housing costs. Now, having said that, we've got all sorts of restrictions on building housing, which is just idiotic, and that will lower the price of housing. But but that's true nationally. So I I just don't think I think people when they choose where they want to live are rational and they balance cost and benefits. So that's why I don't like correcting. Most people do want to correct. Having said that, if we corrected for, uh, Grimes I think has done this, if we correct Michigan for cost of living, I think we're like 37th instead of 39th. It's, in terms of Michigan's ranking as a low prosperity state, it's, it, it doesn't change our ranking at all. May I, one, one follow? Yeah, thank you, I, th I think that 
is very helpful. Um, and it's not something we usually talk about with cost of living, but yep. since someone earlier said in, in a committee that they don't think something like tax rates matter to people, right? I mean, we have a lot of yeah. data about this that suggests if you know that moving from location A to location B means right. that with right. the same salary, you're going to pay $20,000 more in taxes, yep. it matters to people. And they figure yep. it out, you know, but yep. people make those trade-offs as well. Exactly. Would you concur that that's, that's something, like you said, people exactly. are rational. They decide where yeah. they're going to go. Yeah, and look, I, Texas... We're looking at 25 to 30 furrows with a four-year degree that are moving to high tax places. It doesn't mean everybody's moving to high tax places. I'm just, but that's the group that is driving the future economy. That's why they matter so much. And what matters to them at the moment, at least all the for the last two decades, really, is um, are these great places where they don't have to own a car. And Michigan's not invested in that. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm sure we could talk for many, many hours, but we started committee late. We're up on the hour. So, Lou, thank you so much you. for coming today. Uh, seeing no further questions and no absent members, uh, the Committee on Economic and Community Development is now adjourned.